So as a roboticist, I might say that the barriers to adoption and innovation are humans, and so the more quicker we get some of these things out there, the better. But I was a bit of, um, but in, in a bit of seriousness, so the, um, we've seen it many times in Australia where organisations have just said we're going to go through automation and we're going to start our operations straight, straight from the beginning in an autonomous fashion and bypassing a lot of the issues that we have. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about the collection of nouns that you see up there in the, in the title frame mm -hmm. uh, and, and its application to horticulture. So field robotics is very unlike other robotic systems that you might know, such as manufacturing robotics or in-house robotics. Field robotics are robots that have to work outdoors 24-7, all weather condition, rain, hail, shine, wind, day, night operations. And so the science behind automation for those types of systems is very different from manufacturing robotics. There's a, there's a, there's a significant difference in that work that we do. But what we're really interested in is being able to take machinery outdoors and have them automated in some way and even intelligent. Uh, big data, I'll take on the previous comment about big data versus small data, but I'll actually not look at it in the same way. Small data to me, the way it was represented before, is big data. If I can go down to the centimetre level, middle metre level, then I'm going to get lots of information. What do I do with it? But actually big data here, I'm putting it up there because it's, it's a bit of a misnomer. We don't have a lot of data in agriculture compared to other industries, and especially in the horticulture industry. And that means something because what it says is that we're really basing a lot of the processes that we have on models that we build, physical, geo, biological models that we build in our heads, equations, and then we kind of give it a little bit of data and use those equations to kind of describe what will happen in the future. Big data will change that. Field robotics will change that because now what I have is the opportunity to collect multi-resolution temporal spatial data, spectral data, at fine resolution, um, continuously, and so I'm going to get a lot of that information. And so there's a question not just in terms of how that changes operations, but also how it changes the science of horticulture or agriculture in general. In the past, I'd be interested in writing equations and doing some sample sets, but in the future, I'm going to be co collecting a whole bunch of data, and that data is going to tell me the model of the world, and how does that model then tell me and predict for the future for me. So there's something there about small data versus big data and what the future is. Intelligent systems, robots are out there, they're collecting data, I'm building up these models, what I really want to be able to do is automate actions, you know, spray precisely all the way through to harvesting, for example. And so how do I codify a lot of that decision making and those action space into a robot and make it work? And I'm going to focus on horticulture because a lot of the examples that you'll see in automation in agriculture is going to be broad acre. And that to me is really easy. It's just flat land, open space, see the GPS satellites, off I go. Okay, and I can automate a lot of the machinery. You start dealing around trees where you get GPS attenuation, where a lot of the information is not from the above but from the side, for example. Or when I'm looking at crops at a very, very small scale, such as in row crops, and I have a very, there's different challenges that I need to deal with. And also importantly, because of the high labour costs that we have in, that, in the industry. So this slide is really just saying that uh, it, may, you may, it may look like you know, blue sky kind of research where we're throwing robots out into the field, but in, in fact not many people know that Australia leads the world when it comes to the research and development of field robotics and also the commercial uptake. You've heard about the mining industry and that's been going on for about 15 years now in automation. We've worked closely with Rio Tinto over those last 15 years with those automation programs. Uh, the middle picture in the bottom there is an autonomous straddle carrier. It's 100 tonnes, moves around at 30 kilometres per hour. Uh, the vehicle on the, on the far left, the mining vehicle, is 400 tonnes when it's fully loaded, autonomous as well. So these are large machinery working 24-7. You go to the port of Brisbane, you'll have 34 straddle carriers moving around autonomously, moving containers left, right. It's going to Port Botany this year and then Port of Melbourne next year. And the picture on your right is a diagram that describes the network around the world of commercial, for commercial aviation. And the reason why I'm putting up that is because we're doing the flight planning system for Qantas. So next year you'll be able to fly the A380s with no pilots. Joke. <laughs> Sorry. I don't want to take that anywhere, right? But no, we're redoing the whole flight planning system um, for them, which makes um, a lot more fuel efficient flying. But the reason why I put that up there was because I get told a lot that agriculture is difficult, the optimization, farm optimization is difficult. I can tell you now, if you want to see the regulations and the safety codes and the laws and all the things that we have to codify for flight planning, it's a very difficult problem in comparison. So there is, so it's not, horticulture is different and hard for very different reasons and not for the reasons that some of us think. So I'm just going to go through some examples uh, quickly as we go through. I am going to talk about drones, but I do agree with uh, the previous comment about there's just too many out there. Uh, one of the projects that we first had was Meat and Livestock Australia, and I'll relate that how it comes to horticulture um, in a second.
But the picture on the left is kind of what you're seeing now. You, you're kind of seeing these drones getting flown around. Everybody has them now. We just go through regulations and so forth. But in fact, it's not the UAV or the drone or the robotic aircraft that's important. It's what you're going to do with the data afterwards. And we've heard a lot about that. And the top row there is really just saying what people like doing, collecting aerial images. But really, and, and then kind of stitching those images together. But it's the bottom feedback loop or forward, feed forward loop that I want to talk about, which is how we use big data, machine learning techniques to take that data and then classify that information in real time. And that's important because if I can do it in real time, then the robot can be smarter and if the robot can be smarter, it can do actions in the, in the field. One of the first, and, and in this particular case, a lot of the project was about invasive species. So can we come along, fly a UAV over a certain area, collect information and in real time determine whether there's a weed or a native vegetation? One of the first projects we had was with Land and Water Australia where they were interested in detecting aquatic weeds coming in around horticultural landscape uh, through irrigation channels. And this platform that you see here, I don't know if I can run this, if I can use this mouse, will you see the mouse? No. Okay, okay there we go. So this UAV here, it's just a helicopter off the shelf, but we then modified it and so forth. Uh, there's a little camera system out the front, some electronics in there. And the UAV will fly, it'll detect where the edges of the river is, so it can fly through the middle of the river. Um, it's got a camera system that looks down and it passes the information through to a bunch of computers in there and those computers will have machine learning algorithms and it will detect the difference between an aquatic weed and native vegetation. Once we've pinpointed where the aquatic weed is, the helicopter will spin itself and those little spray boom arms that you see over here it will come along and position itself and spray herbicide just on the aquatic weed. And so there's things like that about where we're able to take the information and feedback that information to an action space. Likewise, a project with Meat and Livestock Australia, but looking at woody weeds um, and detecting woody weeds so we can fly around, in this particular case, for hours or an hour and a half with this particular aircraft. We can stitch information in real time at a low resolution and process, process at a higher resolution. And then what we can do is um, some various techniques, like, for example, detecting individual trees and also the size of the trees. And the only way we can do that is getting down to the centimetre level. So we're getting high resolution imagery, collecting all that information and then resolving that information. And you'll see little bounding boxes, so little um, pinpoints there we're showing the centre crown of a tree, and this is done autonomously and in real time, as well as the bounding box which represents the size of the tree. And for a cattle farm, it's important from a carbon footprint perspective as well as what's going on. But when we pass it to the machine learning algorithms, what we can do is then start to detect where the woody weeds are versus the native vegetation. And later on, uh, we've developed some optimization algorithms the, con the farmers didn't know if a contractor came up and said it's going to take me 10 days to remove all your weeds. The farmer had no idea whether that was true or not. But flying this for an hour over the whole property, then you can start to build these optimization algorithms that you see on the bottom here, which is really representing what the most effective path is between all the, between all the weeds and, 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 and delivering that information in terms of the quickest time to remove the weeds. And the reason why I was presenting all that is because of the current project that we have with Australian DAF, which is looking at, in a horticulture application, a multi-UAV system. What would work on a farm, such as what's on the bottom there, as well as what would work on a regional scale, which is what's up the top. And how do you relate that information together and start building uh, a pest management program, both on the farm and then onto the broader scale um, across the region, and, and detecting the kind of crop culture that you have. Um, so it's a quite a big program, but the reason why I wanted to kind of talk about drones was uh, agree that there are too many drones out there and too many companies out there that are doing it, and not many people are going to be able to afford the technology that's there. And a lot of this work is focusing on using UAVs that can fly for long periods of time that are, where the information is shared between many different users, and not just farmers, but many different government organisations as well. So it's almost like a, a robotic Google. You kind of type in your query about the information that you want, and that kind of goes through a task list, and when it gets, collects that information that information then becomes available to you. So that's on the drone side. So we'll move to certain ground vehicles. Um, this, these two robots are Mantis and Shrimp. They're two robots that we had previously in a program. They're electric battery operated uh, robots. Um, you can see what they're doing is they're moving in a certain direction, but they've got sensors that are looking off to the side on the, on the trees. And uh, they've got sensors such as laser, thermal, infrared, stereo vision, uh, as well as uh, conductivity sensor for water and, and an ion sensor for measuring, uh, or gamma sensor for measuring ions. Uh, in the ground. Uh, there are a number of different sensors on there, not the sensors that you would probably actually use on a final product, but sensors that we had to use as part of the research to determine what works and what doesn't work. And it's the same type of process that I showed you with the drones. You collect the data and then you pass them through a series of algorithms, data mining algorithms, machine learning algorithms, and from that extract information in some form. And what we're interested in here, down to the centimetre resolution, is being able to detect individual features. Okay? And those features could be a leaf, a flower, an almond, an apple, whatever it might be, and then from that start to build up a bigger picture of the, the environment. 
So this is the robot going down an apple farm. It's a trellis structure. On the left is the image that the robot's collecting, and in real time, it's determining where the flower locations are. So by the time it gets to the end of the row, it knows exactly where all the flower density is. It also knows the number of flowers per tree, so it's detected in each individual tree. Um, and, and it knows the X, Y, Z location of the flower on the farm. Okay, and that becomes important for later if we want to start looking at pollination techniques, automated pollination techniques, or thinning techniques. This one here is just showing you later when we come back and we're actually looking just before harvesting. Again, the image on the left and on the right is where it's detecting the individual apples. And so again, you know, now we know the size of the apples. Okay, we can determine that and using the colour and if they wanted to, how does colour then relate to ripeness as well, be able to determine where the apples are. And what was important here is it wasn't so much that we could just determine the number of apples down a row um, and also the X, Y, Z location of the apple, but for the farmer, we, could th we threw the data in just through a data mining and tried to look at what the correlation was between the flowering and the apples. And what we found was that the farmer wasn't getting their pollination program right. And it was quite a simple process of them moving the beehives the next year and their yield count increased dramatically. But the other thing that I want to point out here is the, the trellis structure, and that was, that's important because if you look at the almond, which was that vase type structure, and the trellis structure of the apple, you get two different types of phenomena happening. The apple farmer here went trellis structure because he thought it would save labour cost. If I go trellis, then the apples are all on one side, it makes harvesting easier. And it was true, 30% reduction in labour cost. But what it also made, ensured was that the automation program was a lot easier to work on that type of scenario as well. If I can see everything, then I know everything about the plant. If I can't see everything like in the almond or in the standard apple tree, for example, all I can do is infer about what's going on in there. So there's, there is this relationship about what does a future horticulture enterprise look like when you look at not only robotics and automation and optimization and data and analytics and so forth, but also what do you do about the tree architecture and the operate or, or the farm architecture itself. And there's that relationship that I think is quite important. And in a country like Australia where we have experts in both fields can come together and really change what that future looks like. And one of the projects we had was also looking at how you might automate the harvesting process. And this is quite a hard problem. This was the first thing that the agriculture guys were saying. Can we harvest? Because that's where the labour cost is. And it's hard. If you think about what's happening is that you're trying to match human dexterity okay, and agility. And that's a, quite a hard problem to do. And also pressure points. The ability for a human to be able to understand how hard to grab an object or how soft to grab an object and how to twist it without damaging is quite a difficult um, scenario and trying to emulate that in, in, in robotics is quite difficult and so that's another area and so we've been able to do certain things but it's not something that you could actually say we'll go out into production and start delivering it but that's a classic area where tree architecture crop architecture and robotics and automation will come together hand in hand this is just a movie which I'll if I can yep I'll just jump through quickly it's showing you the same results but on an almond farm and what we can do this robot <laughs> I can't use GPS here. The GPS signal is attenuated because of the tree structure. So it jumps around. I've got to be able to use a laser unit to detect the tree trunks. And the laser unit's also being able to detect individual um, uh, uh, trees there. And I, I just wanted to kind of, if I could just stop there. For years, you know what a tree is because you've always been taught what a tree is. So your brain kind of builds up this mental model of what a tree is, an abstract notion of a tree. So you point to something else, it's a tree. For a robot, how do you codify what a tree is that doesn't break is a quite a difficult problem okay, that we need to um, uh, deal with. But that's part of the, the research and the, and the algorithms. But here you see in detecting individual trees, the robot then can come along and pull out the vision data and from the vision data identify what each one of those trees are and then pass that vision data across to the machine learning algorithms again and then detect that. So here you'll see that it's detecting individual flowers on the almond plantation and then here you'll see it's detecting the individual almonds. And then what, the, what you can do is you relate all that information back onto, say, Google Earth, and we can kind of pop that onto the field, and there's a yield distribution map that represents what the yield or the flower distribution map looks like on the farm. And that becomes important to the farmer. The farmer can click on any individual tree, and that vision data then comes up to the farmer, and they can look at what that tree is. And they can send the robot out whenever they want. Right? That, that particular robot there operates for about five hours on a farm. Uh, the last project that I want to talk about is, is, is Ladybird. This was funding, again, through HIA. Uh, uh, look at Ausveg looking at building a robot for the vegetable industry and we just thought we'd go you know completely opposite and try and think of some very different things so here it's a solar powered robot it can uh, battery operated it can oper run for about eight hours uh, without any recharging whatsoever the latest trial that we went to we operated for three days we had, we just got bored we had to go we finished the project and the thing was still running and there was no charge loss so it was a day very much like today um, so and that really comes down to the efficiency of the drivetrain and the solar energy that's being generated out there. It's also got a robotic arm um, underneath. 
It's an omnidirectional robot, so it means it can travel in various directions and crab. So there was some engineering that we had to do around the drivetrain mechanism and what happened there. But literally now you come along, you pick out the, the points around the farm, um, and you define the road width and you let it go. And the robot will just go up and down and up and down. It's got some sensors looking underneath. It's building up imagery of what it looks like um, underneath. And the, it can detect individual crops um, and also start to look at what's what one of the areas that I'm quite interested in, which is um, uh, weed detection. So this is showing you now the... Um, uh, we're just randomly throwing some green stuff out there. Um, and it's, you can the, forget the robotic arm for now. In an actual system, it would be something different but randomly throwing out some green stuff out there and then you kind of click on a button, it takes an image, it's able to then classify uh, what the green is from what the brown is and from that, so this is taking an image now and then you'll see this little spray jet kind of thing and pinpointing exactly where those little green things are. If you can just see it there, kind of spraying away. Okay, and you can adjust the nozzle um, on that system as it's going through. So that was a lab test, then we took it out to the field and, and we did the same thing in the field. Okay, you can just see just sprayed individual plants and it's now just about to spray those individual ones as well. Okay, no Photoshop editing or anything like that. It just goes down, <laughs> collects the information, XYZ location, knows it precisely, pinpoints and then sprays. And this doesn't have to be herbicide, right? It could be nitrogen, it could be whatever you want to kind of pinpoint onto a particular plant. What's, what's just, what the next stage that we're going through now um, is the ability to be able to, if I just jump ahead a little bit quicker, You'll see what we're actually, and this is just changing the actual injection strength as well, and also the injection uh, and the concentration. But if I just jump a little bit further, uh, what I wanted to show you was what's happening is the robot's building up this 3D map as it's going through, and that's important because what we're interested in is how do you detect the weed from the crop, even when the crop is very, very small. If I can build up 3D geometry, I know exactly, you know, target, aim, fire, and go straight for that weed. And you can imagine this is great with all the PhD students that are just coming out of the, all their games and whatever it might be. They just think this is the, the best thing. Right? <laughs> and and that, that's it. They're just targeting away as it's going through. So, and it's very, very cheap technology. Okay? It's just how do you put the smarts together and make it work you know, in that way. And the reason why we went for this, and if you go to our website, you'll actually see that we've also done like a mechanical version. So we've had like a mechanical hoe at the end of it all. So no herbicide use whatsoever. It goes to text the weed and actually reaches out and just hose the weed as it's going through, so you'll, you'll see that on the, on the website as well if you're interested. Okay, last slide. This is usually what people look at when they think about robotics um, and intelligent systems. It's mitigating labour costs, labour availability, but also improving productivity. But what I do want to point out is that there's a whole bunch of other aspects that come with robotics and intelligent systems, things that actually operationally will probably generate a lot more return um, than what that labour cost process is. As an example, the stevedoring project that I mentioned before, 60% reduction in fuel costs, 30% reduction in maintenance costs, switch off the lights at night, quarter of a million dollars a year saved in electricity bills, and you know where your system is all the time, at all times. So that's, a, that's an important aspect. But also what I, um, what I do want to point out is this last item here, which is um, it, it will change. If you start to think about automation on the farm, you don't just look at it and say, I'm going to build a robot for Farmer Joe, and then come over here to, to Mark next door and build a different robot for Mark. We have to start thinking about how do we get a bit more standardisation in the architecture around trees, around crops, to allow that automation process to happen. And that's it. Thank you.